So our next speaker is Barbara Ryan from GEO. Um, and you talk up there, so building a global earth observation system of systems. Great. Well, thank you very much, Andy, and it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, well, this uh, the title of this talk is about building a global earth observation system of systems. What I really like to focus on are the data aspects of this because they are essential to, in fact, building this uh, uh, global integrated uh, earth observation system. Uh, let me just set the context a little bit for what the group on earth observations is and what we are quite interested in, and it really is informing decisions and actions for humankind. And so what you will see from this vision statement is that all of our earth observations are really upstream of the decisions that we uh, that need to be made. And so when Sandy in her opening remarks actually talked about making a difference and making some changes, what we are really advocating are that observations of the Earth, around the Earth, in the Earth, on the Earth, can in fact inform those decisions. Now we've got, uh, and so when, when we talk about a system of systems, it's actually uh, this graphic. Uh, whether it is uh, space-based observations or airborne sensors or terrestrial sensors or marine sensors, what we're interested in doing is integrating the observations from all those sensors into a number of different functional areas. We happen to call them societal benefit areas, but they range all the way from agriculture out to weather. Now, we've had some wonderful examples where Earth observations are, in fact, integrated in each of these domains, but it's important that we start uh, bringing all of this information and the information in the interstices of those domains together in a much more coordinated fashion. So many systems, but can you in fact create a global integrated system of systems in that area? We've got a couple objectives for, in particular, improve and coordinate those observation systems. Those are largely funded by national governments. Uh, I want to focus really just on the next two bullets, though, for this particular effort, and that's providing access to that data and information from those systems and advancing broad open data policies and practices. And clearly, for as an international intergovernmental organization, we're quite interested in building capacity. Uh, 98 member countries right now, you'll see we've got some challenges, still some in Latin America, uh, still many countries in Africa are not yet members of GEO. Uh, you will see that we've got some rather substantial holes in the Middle East and the Arab states. And still, at nine, uh, while we are not a UN organization, at 98 member states, that's still only half of the United Nations member states. And so there are still many Pacific Island nations that are not yet members of GEO. And when you think about the impacts from climate change, they are quite susceptible uh, to that. But I think one thing that separates us from UN organizations is this next slide. We have 87 participating organizations that are also sit at the table with those uh, member countries. And so while this is quite a busy slide, what you will see is that a number of you in this room are, in fact, participating organizations in GEO. And so what we are trying to do is leverage the coordination work that you are already doing. We should not, as an institution, come in and duplicate that coordination work. The coordination work of any of these institutions that have a mission or a mandate or an interest in Earth observation. So again, just like on the previous slide where we were trying to fill in the interstices of those observing systems, we're trying to fill in the interstices of these participating organizations as well. So let's move right into the data sharing principles, which I think is so important for this presentation. And that is we are in fact advocating full and open exchange of data that those data and products be released with both minimum time delay and minimum uh, minimum time delay and at minimum cost, preferably free of charge. Now, if in the 10 years that GEO has been in existence, uh, and many of you in the room actually participate on this uh, data sharing working group, 
open day sharing effort. This probably has been one of the key uh, contributions that GEO has made to the community. And you'll see it uh, in a couple different ways. Uh, one thing is that we do, we have a home page, we have a portal where you can come in and get this information. We have emerging partnerships with the private sector. So while we have members at the table, participating <coughs> organizations at the table, there are still thousands of decisions that are made every day by the private sector. Uh, they need to be brought into where. And what you will see here is access, one geology, you will see here access to data that's largely broadly and openly available. Now, some of these individual assets in this part of the slide uh, may actually have a registration procedure for getting access to that data, but by and large, you can get this data broadly and openly available. Now, I just want to talk about one innovation that's occurred in the last couple of years, and it's this part of the slide called our Discovery and Access Broker. Because for the first maybe five, six, seven years of GEO, we were approaching all these organizations and saying, could you register your data to our standards? And it was uh, quite slow going. By 2010, we only had 300 resources registered. By 2011, well, we had about 100,000. As soon as we introduced what we are calling this discovery and access broker, which essentially says you are, the, you control your own data. You've got your own metadata. You've got your own QA, QC procedures. Let's just get the two machines talking to each other through an API. And what you can see as of uh, 2012, the number was up around uh, 14 million assets. Uh, what you see now is it's 174 million assets. So there are more than 45, 45 brokered data providers, like that one geology that I referenced before. Contained within those brokering agreements are a mix of data collections or large data sets and if you dissect each of those data collections or data sets, you can get satellite scenes, rain gauge records, stream gauge records, any observations about the Earth in, on, or around the Earth. Um, now, let's just transition to the importance of broad open data sharing. And this is a, a couple slides that talk about some experience in the United States that I happen to have while I worked with the Geological Survey, and that's on the Landsat data policy. Um, and it was the United States that used GEO, the Group on Earth Observations, to actually announce this change in data policy. So this graph starts in 2007, but the first Landsat satellite actually went up in 1972, so it'd be over here somewhere on the wall. Um, and for those 34 years until this data policy changed, the United States sold Landsat data for $500 a scene when the government operated the satellites, for $5,000 a scene in the mid 80s when the private sector operated Landsats four and five. And finally, in 2008, we were able to go to the White House and the Office of Management and Budget and say, okay, fine. At the peak of data sales, we were selling 53 scenes a day. Now, let's be honest, 53 scenes a day, $400 a scene, 365 days a year, that's four and a half or five million dollars that one agency was bringing in to uh, its organization. That's a substantial amount of money. But when you look at who was buying those 53 scenes a day, number one, other government agencies, number two, universities, largely funded by the National Science Foundation, and number three, contractors, largely funded by the Defense Department. So while one agency, it happened to be mine at the time, was benefiting from four and a half or five million dollars of revenue a year for selling 50 scenes a day, it was not a good investment for the U.S. government. And so we were able to go forward and show who was buying that data. And so here's the trajectory 
as soon as the data policy has changed two orders of magnitude 53 scenes a day to 5,700 scenes a day to this day are being downloaded of Landsat data. So now let's come up to uh, the end of 2014. Uh, what you can see is it's almost uh, 25 million Landsat scenes downloaded globally from this change in policy. And while that's important, certainly for scientists who now can get access to Landsat data, it's also important to the economy. And this is the argument that I believe most of our ministers and government officials want to hear. So essentially in 2011, the economic analysis showed that in the United States alone, there was a $1.7 billion return to the U.S. from this change policy. There was a $400 million change internationally. So I would argue even Europe and Africa and Asia have benefited economically from this change in, uh, in this case, the U.S. policy for a global total of $2.1 billion. That's an annual return that $2.1 billion far exceeds the four and a half or $5 million that one agency was getting from the data sales. So what are people, uh, oh, and let me just say Canada, um, similar experience, this happens to be their radar uh, sat data, 96 out to about 2013. They did not open this data broadly and publicly to all people of the world but they at least opened it up to other federal agencies. And what you see is a one order of magnitude increase by just opening up their radar sat data to other federal agencies. So for our national governments to not adopt broad open data sharing is mostly a barrier to the uptake of your information to your own other sister agencies in your government, but then also to universities and to the private sector that can come in and build value-added products and services. So US experience, Canada's experience, I am convinced that this experience contributed to the debate here in Europe on the Copernicus data policy, which is advocating for broad open data of both in situ and satellite-based observations. It may take a few years, but I am sure here in Europe, we will see the same kind of economic returns from the Copernicus data policy. Um, but what are people using the data for? This is a dark slide, rather dark slide, but it uh, shows the Iberian uh, Peninsula, uh, all the Landsat data that's been collected over 10 years and then put into an algorithm that shows forest change. Uh, same, uh, and this has been done uh, uh, globally, by the way, uh, happens to be Angola, and again, um, uh, over 10-year data, this looks like it's a little bit different, 12-year data, 2000, 2012, 2013, where you can see forest deforestation and uh, reforestation. So I'm arguing that these global analyses just did not take place before if you had to spend four or $500 a scene for Landsat data. Uh, to do an analysis like this would have cost somewhere on the order of $100 million. That's, uh, you know, you're starting to get up with the cost of a satellite when you've got to pay for that data to do an analysis. So if you want to get to the point where we are, in fact, making a good, strong analysis for the future uh, climate of the Earth, we all have to adopt broad open data policies for our atmospheric data, for our terrestrial data and for our marine data. Um, the last uh, couple slides just say that as we geo are going into our next decade, um, we are advocating three strategic uh, objectives. Continue to advocate for broad open data policies and that national governments continue to invest in their observation systems, that we engage this broad range of users, not only governments, with those participating organizations and the private sector as well, and that we do in fact deliver results by getting easy access to this information. So you will see references here to data sharing principles, data management principles, and then continuing to 
build out this global Earth observation system of systems. Lastly, um, upcoming Mexico ministerial every three years, the ministers of our uh, 98 member governments come together every year. There's a plenary. We're both having them. They're both uh, uh, this week, this geo week in November, the 9th through the 13th. Uh, I hope you uh, or your organizations or governments will join us there if you are a participating organization. And the last thing I want to say, and I'll apologize, is I do head back to Geneva. Uh, right after this. I, I hope I can stay around for a little bit of the discussion, but uh, Andre Obergon uh, in the room, in the back of the room uh, with the Geo Secretariat. Uh, Andre uh, works with us and can answer any questions that I can. And then also we've got many people in the room, Bob Shen, Simon, that have worked, uh, Marco, that have really worked with Geo for a very long time. So I think we'll be able to field any questions that you can get. Sandy, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much. That was great. So, do we have any quick questions for Barbara now? Yes, Bob. So, Mark, uh, uh, I've seen some comments. I figured, or do you have the, also just the data on on the original investment in the satellite and how much it cost to maintain the satellite versus the revenue and, and sort of the old. Now that you have that $25 million, sort of what the return on the whole package was? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, no, not uh, not off the top of my head, but we could general, we could produce it for you. The, the first satellite, I think, maybe went up at about $350 or $400 million a year. And uh, the last satellite, Landsat 8, was about $850 million a year. Uh, Landsat 6 ended up in the ocean. <laughs> And so if you just added uh, those eight satellites up at that cost, and then the annual operating cost to uh, operate the satellite around the order of uh, three or four million dollars a year. So over the whole life of the program, I think we're finding that it's still a much better return for using that data than just the 53 seeds a day that were sold. In fact, it was the University of uh, Jeez, it was Sam Goward. So when he had been at the University of Maryland at the time, uh, was advocating broad open data policy for you know many years. I fought the issue for eight years in the job, but there were people that fought it for decades before me. Uh, Sam's estimate that for much of our satellite data, we're using about 3% of what's in the archives. 3% of that satellite uh, data. When you're in a, a, you know, a, a cost recovery mode, well, you think you're in a cost recovery mode. And I think that's also true, for example, of the climate data that we generate. A very small proportion of the climate simulations that we're running are actually used for the data, and yet we're putting lots of money into that as well. I'm sure you can see We're advocating that those satellites, those stream gauge records, those rain gauge records were largely built at taxpayer expense, and the data is just a natural outgrowth of those sensors, so we shouldn't go into uh, Selling, uh, selling that data uh, as long as long as those taxpayers uh, constructed those sites. I think I want a t-shirt with the land set. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Recovery on. Oh, yeah. I think that'd be great. Data pays off.